to navigate these gray areas. What do you do with gamification? What do you do with big data and AI? The, the technology has moved so far and so quickly beyond what's in our legislation. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've really been looking forward to this um, to this interview. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's nice being here. And I've, I've also been looking forward to, to touching base. I think we're going to have uh, a lot of fun in the next hour. Agreed. And before we get into it, I just need to say congratulations for winning Business of the Year at SAP, sir. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, it was a, a really nice uh, like pat in the back from the industry for the work that we're doing here. And it, it's, it's, it's great for the team because we've got quite a big team in the background that no one sees. Um, and it was, it was really nice for them to be recognized for what they've been doing. And maybe we can chat about that um, a bit later in the in the interview. But before we do do that, I just want the the audience or the, the listeners to get a kind of sense of of who you are, what you're about. So, so Kevin, what are you reading at the moment? Um, so it's actually interesting that you asked that. Uh, I, I read a, a wide range of, of books. I just finished a book called The Undoing Project, which I found fascinating. It was about two psychologists, a guy named Danny Kahneman and uh, Amos T- uh, Tversky, that uh, did, did some very interesting work um, in the economic space and, and came up with some very interesting theories, uh, you know, money ball and how you use uh, research oh, yes. to, yeah, and algorithms and how they work and, and, and basically how fallible and imperfect the human decision-making process is and how that impacts uh, economic theory. So it's actually, a, it was a really interesting book. It wasn't what I was looking for when I, when I was searching for something to read and it just popped up and I went for it and it, it really was interesting. It, it doesn't sound like light bedtime reading, that's for sure. No, no, it wasn't. It took me quite long to read. I was looking for like bedtime reading and, and I somehow found this instead. <laughs> well, and, and on that subject, so in the in the space that you, you're in, the industrial organizational space, what, what kind of keeps you keeps you up at night? Um yeah, so I guess for me there's there's a there's a few things. I, I suppose the two big things that, that jump to mind. The one is um our legislative framework in South Africa and how um, complex that minefield is right now for various reasons, um, and I've mm. often kind of felt that it holds it holds us back a little bit more than it than it empowers us. You know, like I say, some of the other professions in our country, the legal profession, the, the accounting profession, their legislation really protects them, and I sometimes feel that ours um, makes it quite hard to navigate a minefield of how to do the work that we all try to do. Um, which leads to my second point, which is that sometimes. Uh, wonder the impact that we actually have. I think we've got a lot of power in the work that we do. I don't know if it's always, if it distills correctly in how it's used um, yeah, in, in, in the South African environment. Um, we do some really good work, but I, I often feel we some of our quality kind of gets lost a little bit because I don't know if we're um, as appreciated as we, as we could be, if that makes sense. Mm. No, definitely. And that sounds quite contentious. I'm, I'm really keen to pick up pick up on those two points, the legal framework and the impact um, yeah. later on. But, yeah. uh, um, again, just a, a bit more about you. Apart from work, what sort of pursuits um, hold your hold your interest? Yeah. So it's, it's – I sometimes say I'm not the most exciting person. Um, I don't have that many – I mean, I read a lot and I love nature and that sort of thing. The truth is I spend most of my time with my, with my family, with my kids, um, and I, I'm a, quite a serious uh, runner, so I, I run I run quite quite big events, which takes a fair amount of time. Um, and okay. at this point in my life, that's kind of where where I spend my time. Uh, a lot of my other hobbies have kind of fallen away because I put a lot into those two, well, the family predominantly and the running secondary. No, fair enough. So let's get straight into it, Kevin. There's there's a, a kind of offbeat sort of question. I, I read that you had done your MBA as a as a psychologist. Why was that? Why was that the next step for you? What was the reason for? Okay, so when I did the MBA, um, at that point I was running a, a small industrial psychology business called Latitude Twenty Six with a colleague of mine, uh, Paul Leibovitz, um, and I just felt that I was trying to engage with business leaders. I was trying to engage with uh, you know exco members, and I was trying to run a business. Um, and I didn't do a commerce um, route to my industrial psychology qualification. I went the arts route. And it just felt to me that there were a lot of elements of business I actually didn't understand. Um, and I, I felt I needed it to run my business better and I needed it to connect with my clients better. 
um, and, and uh, um, come up with better solutions. So that was really what, what drove me to go into, into that route. Um, it was to get out of the academics a little bit and, and become a little bit more real in, in the business world. So do you think that's, that's a bit of a gap in the, in the education for psychologists? Yeah, I mean, I guess it is. Um, I know a lot of people go a commerce route where they would cover a lot of those subjects that I did in the MBA. Um, mm. And it would, it would definitely assist them. But that's part of the, you know, when we spoke about what keeps me up at night, um, it is one of those things that, by and large, psychology is more an academic um, arts route of qualification. It's, it's a humanities. But the impact mm. you make in business, and um, especially in the South African environment, people speak a slightly harder financial version of the world to what we are trained in. So, so I do think it would be something that would help us be more effective and have more influence if we could just become a bit more um, savvy in those spaces. So what would you say is the biggest value proposition for, for business when it comes to assessments? How would you pitch it? So, I mean, for me, it's, there's, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of avenues. I think one of the areas where we, we need to do a lot of work is I see a lot of people in, in South Africa, a lot of companies do assessments, um, but I don't necessarily think they use the results as effectively as they could. I think we gather a lot of data on individuals, but sometimes it's a bit pigeonholed and it becomes like a recruitment thing and it doesn't necessarily speak to the other parts of the business which could use that data. So specifically the talent management and the succession planning and, and those, those uh, spaces. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's about being able to get out of the psychology and make it very, very real for, for our clients. I think that's a, it's, it's something that the really strong industrial psychologists out there are able to do. And it's a, it's a gap for young emerging psychologists, I think, is to be able to find a way. To, it's the so what question. It's, you've done all this information. You've got all this amazing, you know, information on someone's behavior, personality, preferences, cognition, whatever it is that you've chosen to assess. It's the so what question. How do you take it forward? How do you make it real? And how do you have a lasting impact for that, inv- that individual and for that company? Um, and, and that's the value proposition that I think we need to build and drive in a little bit, a little bit further. I agreed. And, and where would you say your interest lies in terms of using assessments? Would it be at the selection kind of level? Would it be at developments? Where, where's your interest? Yeah. Okay. So my interest would be the full spectrum, the, the, you know, the full life cycle. The truth is I've done most of the work that I do has been, been more in the selection recruitment side of the business, not as much in the, in the talent and development space. Um, I, I, a lot of my colleagues play more on the other side. Um, but that's also where, where I think there's a little disconnect because I think the people that specialize in, in the development side tend to look at other models and tools and the assessments might be a small input, but it probably isn't um, as big a piece of what they do as it is on, on, on the recruitment side of the value chain. Um, so yeah, recruitment is where, in, in fact, that's probably where we, I think we're, we're a lot stronger in South Africa um, is in how we, we assist, uh, uh, assist with the recruitment side of, of the process and where we can add more value will be more on the development side. And would you say that with the selection that we have in terms of the assessments that we've got and, and that are at our disposal, do you think they are more geared towards um, selection and recruitment, getting the getting the right candidate versus using it for, say, development or, or other purposes? Do you think there's a gap for developing new assessments for those new purposes? Yeah, I, I don't actually think we need to, if I was to be honest. I, I think we've got such amazing tools um, at our disposal. There are so many good, strong, valid instruments in South Africa already. Um, it's just harnessing the information it gives you. It's that so what that I was talking about. Um, you know, th- th- there's so much data, and it's just how you how you structure it and how you report back on it to add that value. Um, I, I don't think we need to spend – my opinion is we don't need to spend time developing new tools. We just need to spend time working out how to make the tools we have speak to the, the development side uh, more effectively. Um, or, or filter and integrate into development systems and training and, and, and those sorts of tools. Um, I think we've got really strong psychometrics. I don't think we need to look at developing new ones. No, I really like that perspective and agreed. On that topic, I, I read again um, somewhere that you spend most of your time assessing individuals at the lower levels of organization, identifying hidden talent, assessing the readiness, et cetera. Um, so why are the interests on the, on the lower levels? Yeah. So that's a, a new journey that I've been on in the last 18 months to two years. Um, I did a lot of work previously um, at, you know, executive levels, leadership levels, uh, middle management and upwards. 
and there's obviously mm. important there's there's an important role to play there because there's a lot of people that move into those roles and and maybe um have to change the way they do things to be more effective to to add the value they need to and obviously leaders are the ones who make the decisions that impact the direction organizations go in and obviously the productivity of those companies and of the country as a whole but it felt to me that there's a lot of good people doing amazing work in that space but for us we've got a big challenge in the at the other side of the pipeline you, you, um when you look at it we've got a, a huge unemployment problem in this country but it's even more enhanced when you look at youth unemployment um and it's a bit of a dichotomy because we've got all these roles we can't fill and we've got all these people that can't get jobs um so it felt to me that that there was a there was a a gap to make a bigger impact for the society at large and and for these individuals so that is why at Odyssey Talent Management we decided to focus on entry level people so that you can identify those talented individuals wherever they may be and just let them start that journey i mean the name odyssey is all about the beginning of a of a journey and we see it as a way to 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 chart a path for these young people who are struggling to just get that foot in the door get in the playing field um to begin their journey and and hopefully in that way find some really talented individuals get some other people decent jobs and uh allow the country to prosper and when it comes to talent or, or defining that what is what is your kind of perspective how do you define talent or even potential rather because it seems mm. so nebulous at times yeah so i've also got some thoughts about that and and my sense is i take quite an appreciation view of of uh, human capability and my feeling is that mm. someone is talented based on what they need to do or what they want to do and what i mean by that is everybody has something to offer everybody has something they're good at something they love something they're passionate about um one of the challenges i think we have is that we often look at fast tracks and we look at a leadership pipeline and we we talk about talent as being those people that are being geared to be the next ex- executive of the business but talent can also be that bookkeeper who has a very important role to play where the rubber hits the ground um who loves what they do who's got a deep orientation who's really good at that work because without that person it doesn't matter what the strategy tells you um those people in the call face are the ones that actually make that organization work so i would make the argument that talent is everywhere it's it's about finding someone and putting them in a place where their unique contribution adds to that organization and then they become talent as soon as you move them to a position where they no longer are in flow with what they're doing they no longer become that talented individual So for me I would define talent as getting people to do the right work at the right time in the right place if that makes sense. Mm, perfect sense. So I do just want to clarify because I really like that. Do you think we all have some measure of potential and talent often it's just misplaced or we're in the wrong place or whatever the dynamic may be so it could just be a sense of putting that person in the right place in order to let them flourish and that's when you might see that potential or that talent coming through is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um to to a T, that's exactly it. Um everybody's got a role. It's just about finding the role and then appreciating it and valuing them um and and allowing them to to be happy in that space without feeling that they need to move to a place which isn't in flow with who they are as an individual. So then when it comes to identifying talent or or even leveraging the talent, what do you think from your perspective and and experience what are companies doing right and what are they doing wrong? Okay. what companies are doing right is probably there is it seems like there's a lot of time and effort put into into assessing people so trying to identify objective measures that you can use and obviously I'm talking generally here because there are some companies which which might be a little bit more immature and not necessarily understand the value of objective scientific measures but generally um the big established companies in in our space in our country understand the value in making sure that what they do is valid reliable and biased etc um so we spend a lot of time gathering that sort of information i think for me the challenge is sometimes what you do with it and how you generalize that to what someone needs to do so what i mean by that is i'll talk about where i am at the moment in this entry level space where there are tools out there that people use but it almost feels to me like there's almost a catalog so people will kind of say okay i can assess this behavioral tool that will work and i can use that kind of measure it'll work so if i do enough of these things and i put them together maybe at the end it'll give me something useful that i can use so it's it's a little bit um it's 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 almost like a bit haphazard 
And I think for me, what we probably need to do is take a step back and say, well, you know, it's, it's ask the why are we doing the question? So what are, why are we measuring that in the first place? Is it giving us the answer that we need to know? Um, and it's the same thing I would say when, you, when you're looking at CV screening or algorithms that people use to look on LinkedIn profiles, et cetera. It's really good because it, it helps you get through large numbers of applicants quickly. But you've got to say to yourself, is it really that important that this person has a matric or has a degree? We say it is, but but where's the evidence to prove to us that with a degree, without a degree, you can't do this job? So I would say we need to take a step back and do a job analysis first or just ask the question, why are we assessing this? So we have a, a, a more solid base at the beginning of what we're looking for. And then the tools are there. We have really, really good tools. Um, and a lot of the companies that I've dealt with have world-class processes that are in place. There's, there's um, In fact, when I look at a lot of the international companies um, providing the sort of services that we all do, uh, I almost feel like, like what we have here is deeper and stronger and has, a, has more thought behind it. So I don't, I don't think we, we, we don't have an issue with our process. I think our issue might be around saying, well, are we doing the right thing to begin with? I really like that, especially in a place like South Africa. And I, I was thinking about it at one stage. I, I don't know if you're aware of some of those, those MOOCs or where you can, you can do a micro degree and and just the way they're assessing individuals, it's based. It's a needs based um, type assessment. But opens it up to people of of different ages. For example, um, someone in rural India, they decide to do some of the uh, some of the modules online if they've got that access. And then they they prove themselves and they they have to do a project. But then they get marked off and signed off by others um, based on actual capability. And I just found it such an interesting way of opening up. Firstly, education. In some ways, but mm. but giving across the board the opportunity to showcase what they can actually do, as opposed to saying you need to finish school or yeah. you need to finish this university degree or you need to do this before you'll be accepted into a, a particular organization. Do you think the world's moving in that direction more in terms of finding the quality talent? It's going to be more uh, uh, a school degree or school diploma and a university degree. So what you're saying I find really interesting, um, and I think there's probably a way to go before that becomes something that's accepted everywhere. But from mm. just latching onto that comment, what, be re what would be really, really nice is if you could have some sort of process like that which can give someone a stamp of work readiness. So you can almost have a mm. credential that says to an employer, I may not have finished school for whatever reason, but this is proof that I, I know how to learn, I can arrive, I can work. Um, I can work with numbers, yeah. you know, whatever I need to do to, to get my foot in the door and start working. And I honestly think that would be brilliant if we could do those sorts of courses more um, and, and help people understand the basic etiquette of work so that they can get the foot in the door and, and start working. Um, what you're saying probably resonates quite strongly with me because we know that we've got major challenges with formal education and opportunity um, and just funding education. And maybe what you're talking about is a way to – help overcome that challenge for the country as a whole. There's some really big socioeconomic challenges that could be overcome if we could go the route that you're, you're suggesting. Well, exactly. And I, I think it is often a, a mindset that we have to overcome because we think the um, finishing school and then getting the degree is the seal and the sign of, of, of kind of competence where I, I've heard some of these stories of, of for example, guys in, in rural India, as developers, young guys or who haven't had opportunities, just accessing these sort of platforms and showcasing some real talent. And you're going to miss out on that because they're either rural and they, they don't have proper access to education. But then the talent pool now, if you do access that, becomes that much more um, broad. And I, I think it's exciting times if we can just kind of um, get over that, that mindset of, of school and university as the be-all and end-all. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, and it's not even just about that. It's also about just the opportunity and, and being able, you know, some of the challenges we have here is that if someone, even if they've got that, you know, matric degree or, or some sort of qualification, you then apply for a job and you've got to get somewhere to have an interview or go somewhere to do an assessment. And it might be very difficult to get there just from an economic point of view, just to afford to, to go that route. And um, we, we've got a client that told me a very interesting um story of using, you know, our tool, an Odyssey tool, assessing someone um, online over a smartphone somewhere in Nelspreit or, you know, in that part of the world, Hazyview. And the person had a very strong profile. They, they, they had a profile that was kind of aligned with graduate level people. And they went ahead and did like a telephonic interview where you could hear cows in the background and, you know, a very rural setting and, and they offered this person a job. And for me, it was a really nice 
um, story and quite a heart, heartwarming anecdote because it kind of showed the, the opportunity we created for someone who may have been missed, that diamond in the rough, that just because of where he's based, um, he wouldn't have seen the opportunity, wouldn't have had the chance to, to apply uh, through, through a, a more formal channel. So have you found any issues with, say, access? Because I imagine, firstly, mm. they need a phone or that internet access. How are you overcoming those sort of challenges, whether it's you don't want to disadvantage a, cal- a candidate because yeah. someone's got a better phone than another, all those sort of issues. How do you address yeah. those? Yeah, so, I mean, I, for us, I think um, what we've done is, unfortunately, because what we're using is gamified, it, it can't be done in a normal cell phone. It has to be a, a smartphone of sorts, but we We've gone to try design uh, tools that work on very basic level smartphones um, mm-hmm. and, and that de- demand very little data. And that also, you know, it keeps saving where your candidate's at. So if the signal drops for whatever reason and they get back in later, it kind of continues from where they were. Um, mm-hmm. And the other thing that we've learned, that the other two things we've done from a process point of view is we give candidates quite a long time to complete so that if they need to get to an internet cafe or a library or go somewhere to borrow a phone or something, they've got time to do that. And we've also gone the route of real-time support because we, we kind of recognize that someone who's gone to all this trouble to get somewhere to complete an assessment, if they have some sort of technical issue, to send an email and have to wait for a response um, might really disadvantage them and make it really difficult for them to complete that, that, that process. So we try to give them support immediately so that they, they can, they can kind of solve their, their issue and continue there and then. I don't think what we're doing is absolutely perfect yet. Um, it would be fantastic. At least it works on smartphones and tablets and those sorts of things. But um, in, in general, that, that connectivity is an issue that we haven't totally overcome yet. We still have to find a way to, to have the, the complete answer there. And it, and it sounds like you're pitching it at, a, at the very beginning of the process in terms of that selection process. Yeah. Is this just a massive uh, screening? Yeah. So the truth is that's kind of the space that we, we're playing in at the moment is we, we become that funnel where you can you, you allow people into the process. So it's, it's high, high volume screening at the start of a process. Um, I think, as I said, we've got wonderful tools and processes once somebody um, is already in. So once, a, once they play in the game, we've got very strong ways to, to, to help them and, and to identify where the true talent lies. But it's just to let someone in the door. That's that's the, the the gap for me, and and that's kind of the place that we play predominantly. And I really like that because it it speaks in some ways to what you mentioned earlier in terms of I/O sites having having impact and making a difference. And it seems like giving people that opportunity, yes, identifying the talent and for the the benefit of the organisation to a large extent is great. But opening up that that opportunity, it, it really it really um, I really appreciate that. So I need to say thank you for that for. I'm sure it's got lots of challenges, but um, maybe we can talk a bit about that impact element that you brought up earlier. Yeah. How do you see us moving to to that place where we do have more impact? What's the what's the next steps? What exactly yeah. are we and aren't we effectively? Okay, so that's a good question because that's exactly where, where I'm at is I intuitively feel like we can do a lot more with what we get. So we have a lot, you know, we if you think about it, we get lots of this data from these people all over the place. And the client that's requested that data might only have a handful of roles they're trying to fill. So then you're going to, you've got all these people that have gone through this comprehensive process who you know are looking for work and you know what they're good at because everyone's good at something, right, or suited to something. Um, so for me, the, the gap would be in, in proactively finding some opportunity for those people who weren't successful in whatever process we're talking about and, yeah. and potentially linking it, you know, maybe collaborating with, with – um, training specialists or work readiness specialists just to fill those gaps because now we've got the profile. We know where these people, where they're strong and where they're not strong, what they need to work on and maybe finding a way to help them um, bridge the gap a little bit. So, so wherever they, whatever they were unsuccessful in, whatever they weren't able to demonstrate to get that job, potentially you can help them learn those skills because we, we focus very much on, on skills. So it's not, cognition in 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 the deepest classical sense it's literally saying are you able to learn a task and apply it are you able to work with numbers um can you converse in english is your detail orientation in place it's things like that so you could theoretically say that yeah you can't do it now but here's a couple of courses that you can do in your own time and in two or three months we believe you'll be strong enough and then you can try again you know and for me from in, in our world those are the two pieces that are that are missing to help us make the real impact that that we could I really like that. And, and I'm just uh, spitballing here and tell me what you think. 
I, I wonder if it would be a possibility, and I, I know there might be data issues or who owns what data, but mm. building these files of individuals that you'd have in the background and someone, say a recruiting company, has an idea of, of what they're looking for, and then they could access, because we've assessed so many people, the data is so huge, it's that they'd be able to identify who would be a potential apart from apart from saying, I've got a couple of candidates, assess these people. Even before that, they could come to um, test publishers or, or consulting houses and say, is there a person with a profile that fits this need? Do you think that could be a possibility? Yeah, so exactly. You, you're right. I think there's a few challenges around who owns the data, who paid for the assessment, um, how clients would feel about people that they've brought on board, um, almost getting the option to leave quite quickly because somebody else found their, their profile. But I think if you can overcome those things and if you can find an ethical, fair set of rules, um, there is that potential to, to, to build a model like that. Um, there's some very real challenges to get around first. But um, sure. in the interest of just kind of brainstorming, I, I agree with you. I think there's, there's definitely an opportunity there. And just back to the, the business kind of case for, for assessments and what, what companies are doing. I, I know as test publishers and consulting houses, we do often focus on the, on the larger employers. You, you mentioned in terms of the level, we do focus on, on managers and leaders, perhaps because impact is, is greater there and assessing people at the lower levels can become a lot more expensive when it's at, at volume, I, I imagine. But do you think that we, we're missing an opportunity with medium to small businesses? Is there a lot of money being left on the table there? Or do you think there are a lot of offerings that perhaps a small employer aren't on taking up as an opportunity. Okay, so so firstly, I, I definitely agree with you. I think um, what what I do see, and it makes sense, that people are willing to spend more money on the more senior people because you, there you've got a smaller pool of people. You you need to find real talent, and the impact that can be made is massive. I do think there's an opportunity missed um, at entry levels um, and at, at more junior levels because I don't think people always see the the hidden costs of turnover, absenteeism, unhappy clients who aren't dealt with at the coalface, um, the, the long lead time to hiring new people, those sorts of things. So there's definitely a space there. I think with small businesses, um, there was a time that I, I, I kind of agreed with you and I felt that the small businesses really need what we have to offer more than, you know, in some ways more than our big corporates because every single person counts. They, there's, there's no passengers in a small business and they, they also – don't, they're not. They, they fight for a smaller pool, if you know what I mean, because they're not as lucrative to go work at a small business as to go work in a big corporate. There's not as as much room to grow and move. So you have a smaller pool of talent to to select from. The challenge for small businesses is budget number one, because they they can't afford the same fees that the large guys pay for these assessments, um, and maturity, because. When you have nothing and you get given an absolute Rolls Royce, sometimes you don't need it. So, so I think this goes back to what I was saying, the so what question and being able to speak the language of business. I think for small businesses, sometimes you don't have to overcomplicate the solution. You can offer them something that you feel doesn't answer all the questions. But for that business, it's going to be quick, it's going to be cheap, and it's going to give them more than they ever had before so that they, they know more about the risk they're getting and, and who the right candidate is to bring on board and they can do it quicker. And I think if someone could find a model there, where, where it's less comprehensive, but it's good enough for that small business owner to, to allow them to afford it, get objective data and make a decision quickly, then, then I think we, we, we open in a, an opportunity. No, exactly. And I, I also do feel sometimes that there's an ignorance, and I, and I say that in the best way, in terms of what is offered and the, the price point that you can find these things at, because some of the assessments that are coming out, the quality in terms of the the validity, reliability, et cetera, and then, then also the price point speaking so well to small business. Mm. I really get frustrated sometimes that perhaps we're not either getting the message out to the extent that we should or, um, yeah, they're just, not getting, they're just not getting the info that they need. Yeah. It's, I find that frustrating. Yeah, it's the, it's the messaging for me. You know, I think the small business owner has a different – their focus is different. Often it's on survival. It's on, it's on getting through now. It's, it's very practical. Um, so they need to make a placement. That's the pain point for them. They don't necessarily have the time to get into the theory and the debate about, you know, the constructs they need to measure, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have the, the luxury of that. They need, they need action and they need it to happen quickly and it needs to be in a, in a language that speaks to them. 
Um, and I think that's where the where the gap comes in a little bit. Um, but if you if you could bridge that gap, I think there is a market there, and I think there's a need. And and just to, to backtrack, you did mention about the legal framework in South Africa and it being a bit of a frustration for you at times. Can you speak a bit to that? What do you what do you mean by that? Yeah, no, I absolutely can. So so there, there's a few things. I know it might be a little bit controversial to to get into this in too much detail. But um, I'm, I'm kind of open to talk about it. I, I find that um, legislation that comes through, which doesn't necessarily speak to what we do in industry. You know, we are health professionals, so we fall in the psychology framework. But everything that's out there is around patients, and it's around patient uh, confidentiality and ethics around doing no harm to patients and, and those sorts of concepts. Where we're working with big data and technology, we're working in big in- industry We've got a range of role players. It's not just that candidate. In fact, who is the client? Is it the candidate or is it the company? Um, it's very hard to, to navigate these gray areas. What do you do with gamification? What do you do with big data and AI? Um, you know, there's, there's a, the, the technology has moved so far and so quickly um, beyond what's in our legislation that it's really difficult to navigate as a professional. So what I was trying to get at is if you're a lawyer, there's a very clear framework you know that a company needs to have a, a, a legal counsel, whether it's in-house or whether it's, it's um, someone that, that they, they have in a retainer because there's certain things you just cannot do without a lawyer. You know that if you're a large company, your CFO is probably going to be a CA because there's certain things the CA does that you just don't get in any other way and you need it because without it, you can't do certain things. And I feel that with us, the legislation is restrictive in the sense that the people that aren't psychologists that play in our space are not drawn to the same legislation. So they can do things and make claims that um, kind of go against our ethical guideline that we all live by as psychologists. That's why we are psychologists. And the legislation does protect us, but it it hinders what we can do because we're trying to abide by an ethical code that that guys in business don't know about. And, you know, in some respects, um, it doesn't really matter to them. They just want a specific outcome. So... Can you give me an example? um, So... For, for example, um, you can think of, we know that psychological concept, constructs need to be dealt with by a psychologist, needs to be given feedback by a psychologist, a psychologist needs to be involved with those sorts of processes. But there are companies out there, um, and, and I don't want to kind of make it a grappling session, that will say very openly on their website, we don't employ psychologists, so we don't have to worry about this, therefore anyone can use our tool. Now, the problem is, what do you do with something like that? Because you can't report them anywhere because they're not psychologists. So they don't abide by by that legislation. And they have clients out there that are are kind of taking this on word and and, and running with it. So that's like one example that that pops in in, in my head. And another one is um, a lot of international companies will claim 98% validity and reliability. And they'll claim that they've done all the research they need to know to, to have done to know that what they do is valid and reliable, but they won't provide that data. So, so a company we can get drawn into the marketing and the look and the feel of a, of a wonderfully designed product and a wonderful technology without understanding the, the psychology behind it. Um, and, and it's difficult because if, they, if they're not psychologists and they haven't been exposed to what we're being exposed to, they don't really know that they need to. It's not, it's not clearly out there. And, you know, the legislation talks um, about, you know, Section 8 being valid, reliable, unbiased. A lot of people don't really understand what that means if they're not psychologists. So that's where the legislation holds us back a little bit. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't abide by those principles. I'm just saying I think those principles have to be more black and white, more clear and more um, understandable to the layperson so that they can make informed decisions of what they're doing. Um, and, and you can't have an audit done by someone who's not a registered CA, but you can go be assessed by someone who has been trained in a tool that's not psychological, that, 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 that it doesn't purport to be psychological. And there, therein is the is is the problem. Interesting, yeah. and I, to some extent, I appreciate some of the the hoops we have to jump through as psychologists here in in South Africa. The legislation is quite tight in some in some aspects, and that psychologists can only administer these sort of assessments. Whereas in the UK, I find when I was staying there, that to some extent you can do a um, a degree, which is fair enough, and then then you 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 can assess. You just have to be qualified on that particular tool and and it's great in terms of volumes and and giving more people access to assessments and lots of benefits but i find on the flip side there's a lot of damage being done by people that aren't properly trained 
and and um, doing a lot of damage, actually. Yeah, and it's interesting. I've had a debate with people about that as well, and I, I also think our context in South Africa is quite different from a UK, where here, if you don't really understand what yeah. you're doing, you could have people um, in a mine shaft doing um, assessments because you don't understand testing conditions. Um, and, you know, you can use assessments on the wrong level where the languages aren't correct. And there's so many things that can go wrong here. It's, it's a it's a much more complex environment. Um you know, a video interviewing with uh, algorithms that, that look at facial expressions and, and give you personality profiles, that might work very nicely in, in the States, for example. But we've just got so many different cultures and people and, um, you know, so much diversity. It's going to be much harder to get that word to work properly here. And that's my concern is that we get tied up in, 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 in our world around the legislation, but the people out there using the tools don't actually understand what they should be doing. So, so you. you know, I agree with you. We've got a fantastic framework in terms of telling us what is right and what is wrong, and you need that. That ethical code is critical. But it's about finding a way to make that empowering for the population as a whole and, and for us as psychologists and, and not as a, a decompetitive factor, which, which makes it harder for you to compete against non-psychologists in the industry, if that makes sense. No, it does perfect sense. I get it, um, and I, I know you've spoken about it already, just in terms of the state of of assessments in South Africa, the the good and the bad. Can you just speak a bit more to that in terms of do you think we at a at a good place in terms of what we offer? Um, and again, I know you did touch on it, but yeah. staying trends, using modern technology, or are we a bit behind? No, I'm, I must be honest. I think we we really really strong in South Africa from an assessment point of view. I think potentially where, where we have some room to go is the full life cycle. So the applicant tracking system from beginning to end. Um, I, I think I've seen a lot because a lot of the companies that I see, and I, I keep talking about international competitors and what's happening internationally because I do quite a lot of reading there. And I think the, the, the interesting thing for me is I find a lot of the big international players in this space are technology companies first and foremost or they're entrepreneurially driven companies first and foremost, and the psychology comes secondary. Where here, we've got a very strong psychological base. So I find the science behind what we do fantastic, but we, we sometimes miss that we're just that piece of the process. So from an instrument point of view, I think we have very good tools here. I really do. Um, it's more the entire life cycle process that you're offering from start to finish. That's probably where the gap is for me, because we're, we're not driven by technology. We're driven by science. Or by psychology, and and from a gamification perspective, do you think that that we using enough, that we educated enough, yeah. are we dazzled by by things that we shouldn't be? What's what's the what's the the kind of word yeah. on on all your word? Okay, so I find that quite interesting. So so in that space, I think we've got a way to go in South Africa. There's there's only a few developers that I, I can think of that I know that are developing games in South Africa. Obviously, we, Odyssey Talent Management is one of them. There's a couple of others that I'm aware of that are doing some really interesting work. Um, in gamification in general, so outside of assessments, there, there's some really good people in this country. There's some people that are doing work internationally. So they, they're like market leaders in, in, in that space. But from an assessment point of view, we probably are a little bit behind there. Um, and for me, it's, 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 again, it's quite an interesting distinction. I feel that the psychologists and the assessment practitioners are very aware of what's going on. Um, they, they're, under, they're interested in gamification, but they, they all, um, that I've come across anyway, are aware of the need to ensure that the foundation is in place. We're assessing the right things. We have validity. We have reliability. It's more the line managers and the business owners who kind of get caught up by the look, the feel, and the, the hype around gamification. Um, I, I kind of feel that I, I think it's going to come out in the wash. I think that there's enough strong assessment practitioners out there that people understand what good gamification is versus bad gamification in the assessment space. I think we might get burnt in the short term. Long term, I think we'll be okay there. Um, but I do think we need to start developing more of those games ourselves. The, the challenge is it involves quite a big budget, which and, and there's, there's quite an investment time-wise to get there, um, which is probably why we don't have too many of us in that space yet. But But I do think we'll get there. Do you think it's going to become more commonplace and that, it, and that it should be, or do you think this is a phase? Um, so, so what's interesting for me is it depends what you mean by gamification, because in some respects, an assessment center in itself can be considered gamified because it's a day in the life. You go out of your reality. You, you, you play a role. 
Um, so I think it's it's really how you define gamification. Um, I do think in some contexts it should be done more, but I also think it's it's more about why are you doing it in the first place. And that's what I always say. You know, in some environments, you don't necessarily want people to play a game and they don't want to play a game. They want to be taken seriously. They want to do a proper solid process. They want to walk out feeling like they were given a fair opportunity. In other places, you might want to engage a new generation and you might want them to 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 feel that they enjoyed the process they were going through. So for me, it's 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 not a blanket approach. It, it really depends what you're trying, who you're targeting, and what you're trying to achieve by your assessment process. And I believe there's space for traditional processes, and I feel there's 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 space for more you know high tech innovative games. It, it really just depends what you're trying to achieve with with the solution you're putting in place. Do you find a bit more resistance from the the higher level? So you mentioned certain individuals wanting a more um, apparently solid process, um, old school traditional kind of way of assessments as opposed to the newer generation. Do you find at the higher levels or with the older generation there more resistance with these types of assessments? So so honestly, not really, but it's also because my space that I'm playing in is more entry-level graduate high-volume screening, which is where gamification has kind of found its niche. Um, I don't know of too many real, if you spoke about a classic game that works at those senior levels. There, there it's more the traditional approach that, that still kind of holds true. Um, and I think that's probably the way it's going to be. I'm not so sure you want a short game when, you, when you're trying to hire the next CEO of a listed company. Um, I, I, I don't think games, a short game anyway, um, is strong enough for that. It can be an input into a process, but I, I don't think it will, it will take away from everything else. So it might become part of what you do, but the other, the other stuff will still, will still remain. Um, gamification for me is more entry-level, high-volume, graduate, that sort of thing. And, and I also find it's what you mean by gamification because for me, a lot of gamification is actually driven by big data, technology, automation, AI. And I think that it just, there's, there seems to be a distinction being drawn between AI solutions um, that are, are more like self-scoring in baskets and um, exercise, like role plays that, that work on their own virtually kind of that, that are done online that, that some companies are, are, are doing at, at the moment. Um, that seems to be when people refer to AI and gamification seems to be more the entry level high volume process. For me, what we really say, and if you want to distill what we're talking about is two things. It's about finding a way to be more engaging for candidates. So the process is more enjoyable and less stressful. And it's about being accessible. It's about using technology so that people can do these things wherever they want to in an environment that's comfortable for them in a time that works for them. That's probably more where we're talking. And if you're looking from that place, then then I think that is the way that the assessment industry is heading. Do you find it disadvantaging anyone? So I'm not going to say older people because you've spoken mm. to that, um, to some place where you're pitching gamified assessments. But for example, someone in the rural area versus someone who might have better access to, to games, et cetera, in, in a, a more urban setting. Yeah. Do you find that influencing results? So for me, again, there, there it goes down to two things. One is, is what does your research tell you? If you've, if you've done enough studies to know that it's fair to everyone, then you're good to go. Mm. Um, and, and the other thing is, is the purpose of what you're trying to do. So in some instances, you might be wanting people to play a high-tech game because you want them to be engaged, but then you're looking for a different sort of of animal. You're looking for someone who is worldly and exposed to real games that they play kind of all the time. If you're looking at that sort of rural person that we sort of target, it's more about adding in gaming elements to take away test anxiety and, and, and test, test inadequacy. So it's about um, adaptive testing and it's about um, finding ways that, that they, they – uh, the dynamics of the game are, are a little bit easier to work with so that so that they're more engaged and less anxious, if that makes sense. So those gaming mechanics, which in essence is what gamification is all about, can work very nicely in the rural settings as well. A straightforward game that you play, um, it depends the skin of the game and if it speaks to that rural person and if your research tells you that it doesn't disadvantage them. When it comes to AI, machine learning, and all the, the fourth industrial revolution sort of methodologies and applications, do you think as psychologists and particularly in South Africa that we using it effectively, if at all? Um, so that, that's, I think, where the, the, next, the next drive is going to be. Um, there seems to be quite a big push in that space at the moment. But for me, that's, that's the thing is we've got lots of really amazing tools, 
that are used. And, and there's very few companies I find that only use one methodology. They tend to use lots. So they've got lots of data on, on people. Um, and it's about being able to work out what that all means and, and, and how you use that to make better decisions. Um, as I've kind of already said, my, my, my sense is that we're not driven enough by data and by data science and by technology. We're driven more by psychology. So as a profession, I think that's where we have to play catch up. We have to find a way, and that's how to, we really unlock our power, is to find a way to, to, to do that big data and, and provide the real deep um, insights that, that we, I know we have because we have all this information. We just have to find a way to distill it so that it actually is valuable. And I guess there's no excuse, really, especially as we go into the future, for not doing analysis on or using big data to refine our decisions and, and use it for for companies to, to help them make better decisions, where, whether it comes to talent or um, succession planning, all those elements. There really is no no excuse. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would 100% agree with you there. So if you had to look into your crystal ball, what, what would you say the future holds for us as, as psychologists or at least in the assessment space? Um, for for South Africa. Okay, so really interesting question. I think that we 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 are really heading in a, in in the right direction for me. So I've spoken about the legislative um, challenges that we face, but something really interesting is happening in the industry where for the first time it feels like um, the industry and our body, the HPCSA, are starting to work very closely together and are finding a way for for almost for us to to, to be allowed to self regulate in a sense. So. The HPCSA is starting to say that what they're happy to do is to be the regulator and to have an oversight process. And then there's a there's a new body that's been formed that involves many different role players in industry, from SACA to um, the HPCSA themselves to the Association of Test Publishers, um, SAOPSA, et cetera, which is, which is finding a way for us to start to validate our instruments ourselves and to say this instrument is valid, reliable, unbiased. You can work with it. Fantastic. That's great which I think will also help us to work closer together. And I think once we've got that in place, it'll take away some of the limitations that we face at the moment um, and and will allow us a bit more freedom. Um, if we can overcome the other challenge I was talking about and find a way to work with what I haven't even spoken about, which is a whole other conversation, is around data protection and puppy and where that's going to uh, play, play a role in, in, in our environment. And I think we're going to find that our world becomes a lot more global. We have a lot more people from, from other countries coming here and, and we are going to go to a lot more other countries and do work in, in those places. I think the global market is going to grow quite quite quickly. And I think technology is going to become a, a technology and data protection is going to become a, a big uh, process, like balls that we need to juggle. If we can find a way to overcome those two things, if we can find a way to enhance technology to help us do all these things that we in the last 50 minutes have been talking about and we find a way to work with puppy and and understand how that data can be enhanced and and and, and utilized I, I think we have a big role to play in in society going forward and i think our market is going to grow exponentially like i say we, we have amazing tools i think that we have practitioners and tools in this country that are, are world leading we just have to find a way to unlock it through technology so that we can compete with the guys that, that are out there with the budgets and the, the sexy marketing material um, and, and, and bring the rigor of what we do and make it real worldly to, to business leaders. Um, if we can do that, then, then I think we, we've got a, a really exciting future and I, um, we, we have a big role to play as well in terms of helping society move forward. I know at the Cyber Conference, they were focusing on the fourth industrial revolution yeah. and for audience who don't know who that is or who that body is. It's just the Society of Industrial uh, Industrial and Organizational Psychologists in South Africa. But you were at the conference and it's a focus on the future. What were some of the takeaways or, or what excited you about the conference in terms of the prospects that we yeah. have? So just these conversations that are that are coming out and, and a lot of the AI stuff that's coming out, people, it, it seems like we're starting to understand what that really is how that works and how that, that can enhance what, what we do. Um, one of the big um, trends that came out for me outside of the gamification and then the technology is there seems to be a realization now that at least in our space that AI is something, but it doesn't take away judgment. Someone's going to have to build those algorithms so that they are ethical and fair and, and are unbiased. So there's a big role for all of us to play. Um, and I think what's what's quite exciting is our role becomes slightly less transactional. I feel like a lot of um, independent psychologists spend a lot of time assessing and writing reports. 
Um, and what's quite exciting with the technology for me is that once the technology can do that for you, it allows you to add more, more value. So you can spend more time doing the research, giving the big data, building strong algorithms, providing decisions, uh, helping your, your, your clients make the right decisions. So it's almost going to raise our game to, to a higher level where we engage um, in the right way um, because a lot of what takes our time, we won't have to worry about anymore. Um, as an aside, something for me, when we talk about the, the, the fourth industrial revolution that I've been kind of grappling with in my head, I, I kind of believe that in a capitalist society, people are going to do what makes their profit margins bigger. So people are going to automate and are going to find ways to do more with, with, with less input, which is fantastic from a profit point of view. But in a country like ours, where we have so much unemployment and such inequality in education and opportunity, I almost feel there's an ethical issue coming out here. And, and, and I would love to find a way to engage with the guys that make our labor legislation and find a way to just give a carrot and say to people, here's an incentive not to automate. He has an incentive to find a way that you can maybe use automation to help people do their jobs better, but to, to hire those people that don't have these skills. Because I, I do have a big concern that there's going to be lots of jobs created, many of them. We already have jobs we can't fill because we don't have skill, and we have people that can't do it, get jobs because they don't have the, the qualifications or, or the skills that they need. And I think that that is going to be a huge challenge for us going forward. We have to find a way to bring those people in and use them whilst um, – embracing the industrial revolution. And I don't have the answer to that yet, but that was um, a dilemma that I walked away from from the conference. And that leaves our conversation a little bit open-ended because I, I was going to end it there, but perhaps it's an invitation to come back at a later stage and we can uh, finish the conversation because I, I, I could really pick your brain for the rest of the afternoon, but I, I know you have places to be likewise. So I am going to leave it there, but I, I do want to thank you for your time and your input, Kevin. It was really valuable. That's an absolute pleasure, Andrew. Thanks for the opportunity. It was great to, to share some of these thoughts. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope it's been thought-provoking for, for everyone who listens to this. Um, and uh, hopefully together as a society and a group of people, we can, we can make a change and, and, and keep adding value. We're looking forward to the future. Thank you, Kevin. Cool. Thank you for listening to the JVR Aquanda podcast. If you would like to share your insights, contact Hofmeyer at jvrafrica.co.za. That's H-O-F-M-E-Y-R at jvrafrica.co.za.